gadgetry. And uh, Rekhsaman Ramakrishna was born in 1952 at Chidambaram, uh, Tamil Nadu. And he had his uh, bachelor's degree in physics from MSc University of Baroda and PhD from University of Ohio. And then he has been working all the time on ribosomes that make uh, proteins in the cell. And he has uh, several uh, fellowships and then in different uh, honors and all that. And uh, right now he is working on uh, the structure and function of ribosomes and the action of antibiotics on ribosomes. May I now request? Thank you. So thank you very much. Can people hear me? Yes. Hello. Okay. Um, yes. So I'm very sorry about the delay, but I actually had no opportunity to um, set up the computer before this. So I'm sorry it took a little time. So I want to give a very general lecture because I was told that there are people here from different areas of science. There are school children here, there are, there are young college students. So I'm not going to assume any knowledge of molecular biology, but rather I'm going to assume that you're just uh, you know, an interested uh, member of the public. And I'd like to give you a flavor for uh, what this work is all about. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about antibiotics, and then in uh, Tom Stites' lecture, He's going to give you a very detailed uh, view of some very important antibiotics and how they can be used, how these structures can be used. So I'd like to start off uh, by showing this picture. Uh, you may not recognize some of these people. These are great writers on the top. Mozart and Schubert were very famous uh, classical musicians. But since we're in Madras, all of you uh, ought to recognize Ramanujan, the famous math mathematician. And the point is that all of them died uh, when they were very young of infectious disease. And today, uh, we, if we get an infectious disease, we simply expect to go to the doctor and get antibiotics and be treated. Although uh, that's not always true even today. Because uh, even today, there are about 100 million people uh, worldwide who have uh, active tuberculosis, which causes 2 million deaths a year and there are resistant strains of uh, tuberculosis emerging. And uh, an interesting, a more important problem in the West, TB is a problem worldwide, but in the West, uh, this organism, Staph aureus, uh, so-called because of its gold color, uh, is a major problem uh, in infections because it likes to invade wounds. So it's very often uh, a post-surgery complication in hospitals. And it turned out that when penicillin was discovered, uh, nearly all of uh, Staph aureus would respond to penicillin. So the number of resistant organisms was very, very low. But as soon as penicillin became introduced, the fraction of Staph aureus that was resistant grew very rapidly in hospitals, but even in the general community caught up with it. So today, nearly all Staph aureus is resistant to penicillin. Now, there are other antibiotics that Staph aureus is sensitive to, but uh, in fact, there are now multi-drug resistant Staph aureus that responds to only one antibiotic, which is vancomycin. And there are actually reports of vancomycin resistant Staph aureus, although not in combination with multi-drug resistant Staph aureus. So it's clear that uh, if, if, we, if these things uh, combine, we could have a Staph aureus that doesn't respond to any known antibiotic. And so, it's, so we really need uh, development of new antibiotics. And you can see that in England, uh, there, was a, there were a number of deaths in hospitals due to these multi-drug resistant uh, Staph aureus. And this is John Reed, who was the uh, health secretary the, uh, at the time in 2004. Uh, you know, asking hospitals to take action about infection rates. So um, the whole idea of antibiotics in the modern era, of course, traditional medicines always had some uh, thing that they would use to treat infections with, but without actually uh, knowing about bacteria and so on. And the first systematic scientific effort to 
uh, try and develop something that would target bacteria, uh, was by Paul Ehrlich, who observed that if you stained bacteria and looked at them under the microscope, there were certain dyes that would be preferentially taken up by bacteria, but not taken up by human cells, these are lymphocyte cells. And so um, this led him to think that maybe if you had a dye that was toxic and bound specifically to bacteria, it would then have a magic bullet that would only kill bacteria and not harm uh, organisms. And Paul Ehrlich was not, he had the idea, but he wasn't quite so successful in producing a useful antibiotic. And that was first done by this man, Gerhard Domat, uh, whose uh, contribution was interesting because he worked for the Bayer Chemical Company, which made a huge number of organic dyes. And he very systematically tried all of these organic uh, dyes for their effectiveness against bacteria. And he came up with this drug called, this compound called Prontosil, which at the time was miraculous because it was the first highly effective drug that you could give to humans and uh, it was effective against fatal uh, infections. And at the time, streptococcal infections were very, very serious because you could get a cut and you, it would get infected by streptococcus and the streptococcus would simply uh, grow a lot from the region of the cut. And often you would have to amputate an entire limb or it would be too late and it would become systemic and you would die. And it turned out that soon after he uh, discovered Prontosil, he was able to save his own daughter from having her finger uh, amputated. Now, one problem with Prontosil was that when people tried to understand how Prontosil worked in uh, humans, it turned out that Prontosil was broken down into humans, and one of the com compounds was a previously known compound called sulfanilamide, so he couldn't patent it. His patent on Prontosil was immediately voided because sulfonylamide was already known, so it voided this patent. And <clears throat> there's another uh, unfortunate thing that he had, which was that he was given the Nobel Prize for his discovery of the first sulfur drugs, which was protosil. But this was during, uh, I think it was about 1940 or something, or 30, no, it was actually in the late 30s. But by that time, the Nobel uh, Peace Prize had gone uh, to a German pacifist who was obviously opposed to the Nazis because of their aggressiveness. And Hitler uh, thereby banned all German scientists from accepting the Nobel Prize. So he was not allowed to go and accept the Nobel Prize because he was in Nazi Germany. After the war, he went to, he was invited to a Nobel uh, celebration, prize ceremony, and they gave him his medal and his certificate but they told him they couldn't give him any money because the money had been returned uh, to the general funds, so which was really uh, quite unfortunate, but he's a, a great scientist to whom we owe modern uh, antibiotic uh, discoveries. Now, Prontosil and other sulfur drugs were synthetically made. They were made by uh, the chemical industry. And uh, the whole idea of natural antibiotics arose due to penicillin, which was discovered by Alexander Fleming, when he accidentally discovered that a mold spore uh, in a plate uh, in 1929 seemed to give off a compound and prevented bacterial colonies from growing. And so these, you can see that the colonies are quite large away from the mold spore, but as you get closer, uh, they, they don't seem to grow. And he correctly surmised that there was a compound secreted by the mold spore, and he called it penicillin because it was the penicillin mold. And penicillin uh, became a, the first naturally uh, produced antibiotic that was highly effective. It had very low toxicity, and it saved you know, thousands, millions of lives, actually, during uh, the war, at the, towards the end of the war, because uh, a massive effort was made uh, to make large amounts of penicillin. Subsequently, people explored lots of other bacteria, especially soil bacteria, and a single genus, Streptomyces, has given us a vast amount, vast number of different antibiotics, and Streptomyces is a genus of soil bacteria. And if you look at uh, all these antibiotics, uh, 
all of them that were that were isolated from these various strains of Streptomyces uh, have one thing in common, and that is they all work by blocking protein production in bacteria. So this naturally leads to the question of what are proteins and how are they, uh, why are they important and how are they made? Okay. So um, you can. I'm going to show you a lot of molecules. So I want, to, and I'm going to show you these molecules in different ways. And so just to tell you uh, how we can show the same thing in different ways, I just want to illustrate that using uh, humans. So on the left, you have uh, a very detailed image of a human being. Okay, that's uh, what we call a very realistic representation. But you can also greatly simplify this and still convey the concept of the person. And that's shown here in terms of cartoons. Now the cartoon is very simple compared to the actual uh, person, but nevertheless conveys some essential information, essential features. And if you, you can simplify this even further by showing the object symbolically. I don't know why I need to see myself. It's, it's not actually slightly distracting. OK, so you can still see. Um, you can still show the person as an icon, and if you know what the icon represents, what aspect of the person the icon represents, you immediately know that this icon stands for Clinton or this icon stands for Bush. Okay, Clinton would never be able to decide some anything on uh, at least early in his term, and so he was called a waffle because to waffle means to not be able to decide, and. Uh, this comes from a Texan phrase called all hat and no cattle, uh, which suggests that you know there's not much underneath the hat. And so that was uh, the representation for Bush. So you can similarly represent molecules in very different ways. So this is the molecule DNA, which was discovered by Crick and Watson, uh, the structure. And this is a mechanical, a metal model that was drawn to very large scale. And here they are in this historical photograph. Now, if you were to look, if you were to uh, portray it in a computer and show all of the atoms, then this is what it would look like. Although the atoms are not uh, drawn uh, to their proportional sizes, but at least you can see all of the atoms. But sometimes you want to simplify it even further, and so this is a very uh, standard way of representing DNA by showing these two ribbons wrapped around each other, and you want to show that DNA is composed of four types of building blocks, so you can give them four different colors, and you, to show you that A will only fit with a T and G will only fit with a C, you schematically uh, made the joining between these building blocks uh, different, so that you convey the idea of two pegs fitting with each other. Of course, the reality is nothing like this. It's actually hydrogen bonds uh, that are complex where you have complementary acceptors and donors. But nevertheless, this actually conveys the concept and the architecture of, of DNA. So when I show you lots of molecules, you need to keep in mind that the representation may be different. So we talked about proteins. And uh, I said that many antibiotics work by blocking uh, protein production. So the question is, what are proteins, and why are they important so that blocking them should uh, actually kill bacteria? Now, I'm showing you three different proteins here. Uh, one is collagen, whose structure, incidentally, was first discovered uh, in Madras by uh, G. N. Ramachandran. And uh, you can see that it's a long filamentous protein. This is a protein that makes up our skin and uh, cartilage. This is here.